Now, uh, it's very nice to me to see that a lot of you have already heard a little bit about neurodiversity before. Uh, today, I will be presenting to you some of the work that I did at um, um, the university I went to here in Germany. Um, and uh, a little bit about my experience, what neurodiversity is, and the work that I think needs to be put in place in more German universities to include neurodivergent students in the future. Awesome. Okay, so I'm just going to stop here. It looks like we have a lot of people. Okay, wonderful. Very excited to have you all here. Okay, so today is going to predominantly be a very much of an introduction, uh, but if anyone have any more questions, you're more than welcome to uh, contact me uh, later on. If you have any questions regarding uh, sources or theories that you want to have more insight into. So I created the, oh, let's see, can I change slides now? No, I don't think I can. Okay. Okay, let's do it like that. I created the Carl's Neurodiversity Initiative, and today I'm gonna to talk about what that is, what is neurodiversity, and what is neurodiversity in higher education, and how can we promote neurodiversity there. So a little bit about the road to creating the initiative. So my name is Serena Enstad, and I'm Norwegian. So I was diagnosed with dyslexia here in Norway in the eighth grade. Dyslexia, for people who don't know, is a, um, a diagnosis which says that you're worse at decoding um, writing and spelling. Um, and when I got my diagnosis, I also got access to all the accommodations that I am entitled to here in Norway, which meant the use of computers, uh, digital programs, and so forth, which I could have with me from my diagnosis until I, uh, and also out into the labor market whenever I entered that. So when I, uh, I did not really have any issues in school, my teacher was dyslectic and she was the one that thought you might be uh, dyslectic, but she promoted the fact that I should go to high school and that I should go to university, no matter if I was dyslectic or not. So I had a lot of support around me when I then entered, decided to enter a German university to take my bachelor's. Um, and I kind of naively walked up to my examination office two months into my studies and I said, hi, I'm dyslectic. Uh, I have papers on this um, and I would like to use my computer for this one written test that we have at the university so that I can uh, write the best uh, answers. And I was told uh, here we don't allow computers for, uh, for written exams we only allow additional time as a form of accommodation for dyslectic students. And I had to inform my uh, examination ad administrator that if I could just look at my paper for 30 more minutes and all of my spelling would be visible to me, then I would not be dyslectic. That's not how it works. And what I realized then was that there wasn't a system in place that could accommodate me and allow me to, um, pass my bachelor's. I was quite worried that if I did not change the system of the university I went to, I would not be able to take my bachelor's. So I decided I would have to talk about my dyslexia, what it was to educate both the students around me, my professors and the administration about what it was. Um, statistically, about five to 20% of the population has dyslexia. I mean, there's a disparity between the two uh, assumed statistics, but it was surprising to me that no one else at this university had labeled themselves as dyslectic given the amount of students that we were. So when I was talking to all my other students about the fact that I was dyslectic, what that meant and why accommodation needs to change, I was led into the idea, into the fact that there were in fact other dyslectic students at the university. Uh, many of them were Germans because there was about a 60 to 40 uh, difference between international students and German students. However, they did not want to come forward with their diagnosis uh, because they did not see uh, that it would lead to anything positive. Um, and I suddenly started to realize that in the German system, as I've experienced it and people have told it to me, in many ways reduces the chances of neurodivergent students or dyslectic students 
to come to higher education. And I think today what I'm going to present to you is why I think it's so important that uh, higher education institutions in uh, Germany implement some of these ideas so they can have access to that student body as well. What was told to me by a fellow um, student was that for her experience, some teachers, we can look here at the quote on the front here, some teachers had even taken upon themselves um, uh, to inform my mother that I was uh, not supposed to be in the gymnasium as I had dyslexia and therefore I was not capable enough. This fate was not limited to dyslexics. What she also saw here was that not only was dyslexic students, but also students with ADHD and so forth, not uh, told to pursue higher education, specifically university, on the pure basis of their diagnosis. And because we work at an international university, we had a lot of perspective and a lot of students' experiences more or less stigma related to their diagnosis. So what we found out was necessary here was to create an initiative that's student-led that drives to empower students to succeed in higher education. Um, and therefore not just educate the professors, but also educate ourselves. Oh, let's see. Yeah, these slides are a bit difficult to manage. Okay, so what is neurodiversity? I've been talking, saying the word dyslexic, I've also been using the word neurodivergent. So I'm gonna go a little bit into theory here today and what that meant, and then we're gonna go on into the practical. So what is neurodiversity? Neurodiversity is a theory that was proposed by the autistic community in the 90s um, or like early 2000s um, about, which could also cover autism, dyslexia, dyscalculia, but also ADHD and hypersensitivity and is an alternative form of um, looking at um, these diagnoses, an empowerment way of looking at these diagnoses. So the model of neurodiversity, it says there is no normal brain sitting in a vat somewhere at the Smithsonian or National Institute of Health to which all other brains must be compared. What this theory is proposing is that there is a divergence in neurocognitive function in the human population and that this is a natural and should be a valued aspect of human diversity. Um, and that in reality, diagnoses such as dyslexia and autism and ADHD is not the normal healthy brain and a little bit broken, but rather an alternative way that the human brain has chosen to develop. Natürlich mit einer Entlohnung, aber auch mit einer Entlohnung, die sich auf der studentischen Hilfskraft Ebene bewegt. Und das ist eine Entlohnung, die aus meiner Sicht dem Anspruch... Um, I'm sorry, I don't know what's going on here, but I think you should write in the chat if this is important. Okay, so let's go back to this. Um, okay, neurodiversity, the concept here is uh, neurodiversity is a diversity of human bra brains and minds and the indefinite variation in neurocognitive function within our space, our spe species. Neurodiversity theory proposes um, that there is some, uh, that there are certain factors which we need to take into consideration. One is that neurodiversity is a natural and valuable form of human diversity. Point two is that the right style of neurocognitive function is a cultural constructed fiction and not um, the understanding that, as I've said earlier, the dyslectic brain is the healthy, normal brain, just a little bit broken. Third aspect is that, that there's a social dynamics that manifest concerning neurodiversity that are similar to social dynamics that manifest in regards to other form of human diversity. This means that one can face uh, stigmatization or um, generalization and so forth. And as I've illustrated by my friend's example, when it came to neurodiversity in um, when it comes to neurodiversity uh, in the German school system that she faced, she faced a lot of misunderstandings uh, because of the amount of misinformation. 
And so lastly, the neurodiversity movement, which is then a social movement that works to seek equality, rights and inclusion of neurodivergent individuals to neurotypicals. Now, this was a lot of words, and I'm sorry for that interruption that threw me off a little bit. But if you have any questions, please write them in the chat. Uh, what we're going to talk about now is a little bit about words and language. So how to use different kinds of terms, because you've heard me say a lot of them. And I will also share with you more terms in the in the library if that is if that is something that you uh, wish. Um, but we're going to focus on these three different terms. And the reason terms are so important and language is so important within neurodiversity is that traditional words that's been used to describe autism, ADHD, dyslexia, dyspraxia, hypersensitivity is so set in the ideas that one is a, uh, one needs to be fixed and cured and doesn't necessarily see um, that as a valued alternative way of being. So... I like the icons on the PowerPoint uh, tools. So you're probably gonna see them a lot through this presentation. So we're gonna talk here about um, three different terms, neurotypical, neurodivergent, and neurodiversity. So neurotypical, this is Tom here. Tom is a neurotypical person. Tom is an electrician and Tom is neurotypical, which means that he presents in a way that is, um, that is normal to the rest of the uh, the rest of society. The way uh, Tom interacts with someone or learns and so forth is not in any way um, is is not in any way seen as odd. Uh, odd. Uh, his abilities is would seen within normal. Uh, Tom is married to Lisa, so Tom is a neurotypical individual. Lisa is a neurodivergent individual. Lisa is a firefighter. Lisa is autistic and Lisa is married to Tom. Now, uh, the neuro Lisa is uh, neurodivergent because uh, she is autistic. Now, their family, so Tom and Lisa, they have two kids in this picture, um, has a neurodiverse family, meaning that there is a diversity of neurocognitive ways of being within that group. That's why we would say an individual is neurodivergent. We would could say an individual is neurotypical. But for instance, universities should be aiming to be neurodiverse, meaning that it allows for a divergent ways of being. Yes. Um, and there can be many different versions of this, having ADHD and so forth, which I've mentioned many times. OK, uh, let's keep going. I think we're going to have to do some practical things here. So now I'm going to give you um, a voting. So first, you're going to vote here. As you've seen, um, I have used the terms. Uh, where did that one go? I have used uh, the terms um, autism um, uh, or autistic. And as you can see in this presentation here, we have two alternative ways. We have, hi, I am Peter and I have autism. And we have, hi, I am Paul, I am autistic. Um, and what I want you to vote on here is whether or not um, which one is identity first language and which one is person first language. This seems like you can only hold one option at a time. That would be annoying because this other one doesn't have any. OK, well, you seem to be getting the point here. Let's see here. So you are saying that predominantly saying that identity first language is option B. And then unfortunately, we can only seem to have one at a time. So we're going to do that. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yes. That is correct. So if we go here, yeah, this is the other one. We will stop you because we can only have two at a time. Okay, so um, some of you, if you're into the disability discussion, might react to the fact that I use uh, identity first language. Now, within the neurodiversity movement, using identity first language is quite, um, or person first language, very much depends on one's own preferences and not on, um, and many have arguments pro and against. 
So one person can use um, identity first language like Paul is using here and Peter can be using person first language. What is important is that we talk about and ask people what they want to uh, be referred to as. Um, I'm not saying talk behind the backs of your friends, just ask them uh, what they want to be referred to if they're not, uh, if they're not there or um, they're neurodivergence. Okay, now we're going to go to the next slide. Yes, I think we have good time. So we're going to do both of these. Now we're going to start talking a little bit about different systems of uh, disability. So you can see here we have two descriptions. Uh, unfortunately, we can only run one vote at a time. The one system is called the medical model of disability. And the other one is the social model of disability. Let me know if you think D or C refers to the medical model of disability. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you guys seem pretty drilled on this. It's pretty impressive. Yeah. Wonderful. We're going to stop that one and then we can see if there's any radical changes uh, when we go to the social model of disability. Which one of these do you think refers to which? I don't know if you can see what I vote. That would be a problem. Um, <laughs> okay, wonderful. Yeah, so you all seem to um, be in agreement here. Um, this first one on the side here is called the medical model of disability. And the second model over here is called the social model of disability. The medical model is what we refer to as more of a traditional understanding of the concept of disability. Within this concept, disability is caused by a health condition. And so disability is in many ways inherent within the person and a society should aim to cure that disability. This is quite a traditional mindset which we've had for a long time. Uh, uh, for instance, there's been lots of discussions about how can we cure ADHD, autism or dyslexia and so forth. And many people within those communities would argue that one should not aim to, uh, that one, one shouldn't see this as a necessarily a disease that needs curing. Um, the second is the social model of disability. Here, disability is the social barriers a person faces when uh, they are in a society that is not accessible to them or accommodated to them. An impairment is lacking an ability the majority of society possesses. And society here should aim to accommodate and by accommodating one is lessening the disability. Now, so I have pretty terrible eyesight. And so if I was living hundreds and hundreds of years ago, although my spelling would probably not be a problem, my eyesight would be. And I would be more disabled through this model in a society where I did not have access to uh, lenses and glasses. Um, and today I would be seen as less disabled. And for instance, if I then live in a country that provides me with um, accommodations to get uh, glasses and so forth, I would be even less disabled than in a country where glasses might be very expensive. This is important when we're now coming to this concept of how to set up higher education for neurodivergent students, because what we're not necessarily realizing is that the system that we're putting in place can uh, unintentionally negatively impact neurodivergent students. And therefore, it's so important that the accommodations that we put in is not necessarily just one set thing like um, additional time, but needs to be considered depending on the person. Okay, so now and we're gonna move on. We have about nine more minutes. Um, okay, so if we're going broadly here, we're seeing that neurodiversity is about variation in human uh, human species, and agreeing that this is a very uh, this is a 
this is an okay way of being. And what we're trying to achieve is lifting the perspective from this deficit perspective, which we have always talked about. Because although my dyslexia primarily impacts my way of spelling, I might also, that might also cause the reason why I'm so horrible at knowing left from right, but it might also have an impact on why I'm a very creative thinker and a very visual thinker. Uh, and a, So what we're seeing in some studies is that if you're some form of neurodivergent, some other abilities might come more easily or you might have other ways of thinking which um, coincides with your neurodivergence. That was a weird sentence, anyways. Uh, what we're trying to emphasize here is a strength-based approach and not necessarily only looking at the deficit, but also looking at the strength-based approaches in higher education when it comes to teaching, when it comes to exams, and when it comes to how the, uh, the students study. Because what we see uh, that in environments where people are can be more divergent and where this creative mindset is um, is held up, we can see more neurodivergent students. So we're seeing evidence that uh, there are more than what the normal distribution in the population of uh, autistic and students with ADHD that uh, go to art schools, for instance, or among entrepreneurs, there is often a high amount of dyslectic uh, entrepreneurs. And what they've managed to do is take their divergence and embrace that to the fact that it becomes a positive aspect of who they are. And then we're going to go very specifically here. And we have nine minutes. We're going to make this even with uh, the little delay here, which I'm very happy about. OK, so <clears throat> what I see in uh, moving forward in the German universities and what I've tried to move forward with at the university that I went is that it's, this is an ongoing going job about figuring out how neurodivergent students can really take on their uh, and embrace their neurodivergence. Um, but what is very important is a flexible accommodation system. So we see that it's very important that uh, students, professors, families are supportive of students uh, with what we would call learning disabilities or neurodivergent students. Uh, if teachers don't believe them, if uh, students are not accommodated or believe that they might have, for instance, difficulties with deadlines, uh, then that has a negative impact on their mental health. What I also finding is there isn't the same legal basis, at least from what I found in Germany as it is in Norway when it comes to these form of accommodations. But what we do know is that Germany has also signed the UN Convention of Rights of Persons with Disabilities. And in Article 24, it says specifically that accommodations in tertiary or like higher education uh, is something that is um, agreed upon. And therefore accommodation is something that we need to have a larger discussion about, about how we create accommodations that are effective. Because it doesn't matter if I get 30 more minutes on the written exam, that's not gonna help me. What we need to do is, uh, is flexible, um, but also uh, evidence-based accommodations, which we see work. What we also see is accommodations can not only be a positive for neurodivergent students, it can be a positive for others. Um, so implementing such as universal design learning principles so that the professors don't all teach in one way. What this can do is it uh, helps certain students which have um, a more linear way of thinking, um, but it can penalize students who create, think more holistically. What we need to create is an exam and a teaching system that doesn't negatively impact students and specifically neurodivergence, I would argue. So what I've done is I talked to some of my professors and I've been like, so what's the goal of this exam? Now, if the goal of this exam was, for instance, to for me to present my knowledge on utilitarianism, then what I asked was, could this could we have other forms of examinations? Could we um, do could we have other forms of accommodations or could we uh, have a discussion instead of a written paper? How can we get to that goal without negatively impacting some students? And of course, I'm going to be having to do written exams. But now I also have Grammarly, for instance. Like, But that is a resource that I individually have to pay for to make sure that the spelling that I, in, in the text that I present are up to academic standards. 
Yes. Um, and then we're going to move on to the last slide. So currently, what we found um, is uh, that educating not just staff and administration, but also ourselves um, helps both uh, helps the students um, and professors in understanding what neurodiversity is, what the why certain students have certain needs. And usually if you understand why a student needs to stim in a class, then it's not as looked down upon or it might not be seen as a disruption. If it's an understood thing that the students just need to have one of those fidget toys, for instance. Um, what I also see amongst uh, the students that I have in my initiative group and for the students that I presented this is that people are stepping away from ableism and the, um, this understanding that they are to an extent inherently broken and providing a perspective of themselves as whole and just uh, a separate way, a different way of being has empowered a lot of them to um, start investigating, not just like study techniques, but study techniques specifically for their divergence. We also see that I'm advocating to some of my students to do niche construction. So this means creating an environment around you that is uh, positive to um, the neurodivergence that you have. So I should not become a secretary because emails scare me because I still don't know how to spell in any of the languages that I, that I speak. Um, and what we're also trying to do is kind of accumulate neurodivergence ways of studying. I know that is a bit can be a bit odd, but I mean, everyone can study differently depending on their neurodivergence. But uh, what we're trying to find is maybe some kind of mm, ways of, uh, of improving that. So uh, we're um, advocating that they use mental maps or we have a certain way of doing research registry that is quite helpful for neurodivergent students. At least I've found that students who have dyslexia and ADHD really like them. But this is, again, an ongoing work, and I don't have that much time, but I hope that if um, any of you take anything from this, or if you're neurodivergent yourself, that um, realizing that this way of teaching and looking at uh, these diagnoses has been really helpful for a lot of the students that I have presented it to. And I hope maybe some of you will take them into use as well to help create a more inclusive environment. That was my presentation. Thank you very much.